of a wimpy kid. The Last Straw by Jeff Kinney. Narrated by Ramon de Ocampo. January. New Year's Day. You know how you're supposed to come up with a list of resolutions at the beginning of the year to try to make yourself a better person? Well, the problem is, it's not easy for me to think of ways to improve myself, because I'm already pretty much one of the best people I know. So this year, my resolution is to try and help other people improve. But the thing I'm finding out is that some people don't really appreciate it when you're trying to be helpful. Like my mom. I thought she'd be grateful when I let her know she should work on chewing her potato chips more quietly. One thing I noticed right off the bat is that the people in my family are doing a lousy job sticking to their New Year's resolutions. Mom said she was going to start going to the gym today, but she spent the whole afternoon watching TV. And Dad said he was going to go on a strict diet, but after dinner... I caught him out in the garage, stuffing his face with brownies. Slork, slork. Even my little brother Manny couldn't stick with his resolution. This morning, he told everyone that he's a big boy, and he's given up his pacifier for good. Then he threw his favorite binky in the trash. Mom and Dad clapped and clapped. Well, that New Year's resolution didn't even last a full minute. He dove right into the garbage can and sucked, sucked, sucked away. The only person in my family who didn't come up with a resolution is my older brother, Roderick. And that's a pity, because his list should be about a mile and a half long. So I decided to come up with a program to help Roderick be a better person. I called my plan, Three Strikes and You're Out. The basic idea was that every time I saw Roderick messing up, I'd mark a little X on his chart. Well, Roderick got all three strikes before I even had a chance to decide what you're out meant. It only took three punches. Punch, punch, punch. They hurt. Anyway, I'm starting to wonder if I should just bag my resolution, too. It's a lot of work, and so far I haven't really made any progress. Besides... After I reminded Mom, for like the billionth time, to stop chewing her potato chips so loud, she made a really good point. She said, Everyone can't be as perfect as you, Gregory. And from what I've seen so far, I think she's right. Thursday Dad is giving this diet thing another try, and that's bad news for me. He's gone about three days without eating any chocolate, and he's been super cranky. The other day, after Dad woke me up and told me to get ready for school, I accidentally fell back asleep. Believe me, that's the last time I'll make that mistake. He was furious and yanked off my covers, yelling, Wake up! Leaving me to freeze. Part of the problem is that Dad always wakes me up before Mom's out of the shower, so I know that I still have like ten more minutes before I need to get out of bed for real. Yesterday, I came up with a pretty good way to get some extra sleep time without making Dad mad. After he woke me up, I took all of my blankets down the hall with me and waited outside the bathroom for my turn in the shower. Then, I lay down right on top of the heater vent, and when the furnace was blowing... The experience was even better than being in bed. Ah. The problem was, the heat only stayed on for about five minutes at a time. So when the furnace wasn't running, I was just lying there on this cold piece of metal. Not good. This morning, while I was waiting for Mom to be done with her shower, I remembered someone gave her a bathrobe for Christmas. So I went into her closet and got it. Let me just say, that was one of the smartest moves I've ever made. Wearing that thing was like being wrapped in a big, fluffy towel that just came out of the dryer. In fact, I liked it so much, I even wore it after my shower. 
I think Dad might have been jealous he didn't come up with the robe idea first, because when I came to the kitchen table, he seemed extra grumpy. I tell you, women have the right idea with this bathrobe thing. Now I'm wondering what else I'm missing out on. I just wish I had asked for my own bathrobe for Christmas, because I'm sure Mom is going to make me give hers back. I struck out on gifts again this year. I knew I was in for a rough day when I came downstairs on Christmas morning, and the only presents in my stocking were a stick of deodorant and a travel dictionary. And Manny got all sorts of toys. I guess once you're in middle school, grown-ups decide you're too old for toys or anything that's actually fun. But then they still expect you to be all excited when you open up lame gifts they get you. Like my grandma got me this book, Math is Rad. She actually said, It'll help you get a jump start on algebra. Most of my gifts this year were books or clothes. The closest thing I got to a toy was a present from Uncle Charlie. When I unwrapped Uncle Charlie's gift, I didn't even know what it was supposed to be. It was this big plastic ring with a net attached to it. Uncle Charlie explained that it was a laundry hoop for my bedroom. He said I was supposed to hang the laundry hoop on the back of my door, and it would make putting away my dirty clothes fun, like playing basketball. At first, I thought it was a joke, but then I realized Uncle Charlie was serious, so I had to explain to him that I don't actually do my own laundry. I told him I just throw my dirty clothes on the floor, and Mom picks them up and takes them downstairs to the laundry room. Then, a few days later, everything comes back to me in nice, folded piles. I told Uncle Charlie he should just return the laundry hoop and give me cash, so I could buy something I'd actually use. That's when Mom spoke up. She told Uncle Charlie she thought the laundry hoop was a great idea. Then she said that from now on I'd be doing my own laundry. So basically, it ends up that Uncle Charlie got me a chore for Christmas. It really stinks that I got such crummy gifts this year. I put in a lot of effort buttering people up for the past few months, and I thought it would pay off on Christmas. For example, I shoveled snow out of Grandma's driveway in the freezing cold, and for Christmas, she gave me a pair of black long underwear. Now that I'm responsible for my own laundry, I guess I'm kind of glad I got a bunch of clothes. I might actually make it through the whole school year before I run out of clean stuff to wear. Monday When me and Rowley got to our bus stop today, we found a nasty surprise. There was a piece of paper taped to our street sign, and it said that, effective today, our bus route was rezoned. And what that means is now we have to walk to school. Well, I'd like to talk to the genies who came up with that idea, because our street is almost a quarter of a mile from the school. Me and Rowley had to run to make it to school on time today. And what really stunk was when our regular bus passed us by and it was full of kids from Worley Street, the neighborhood right next to ours. The Worley Street kids made monkey noises when they passed us, which was really annoying because that's exactly what we used to do when we passed them. Ooh, ooh, ee, ee. I'll tell you one reason it's a bad idea to make kids walk to school. These days, teachers give you so much homework that, with all the books and papers you have to carry home, your backpack ends up weighing like a hundred pounds. And if you want to see what kind of an effect that has on kids over time, all you have to do is look at Roderick and some of his friends. Not a one of them can stand up straight. Speaking of teenagers, Dad scored a pretty big victory today. The baddest teenager in our neighborhood is this kid named Lenwood Heath, and he's kind of like Dad's arch enemy. Dad has probably called the cops on Lenwood Heath about 50 times for knocking over our garbage cans and stuff. Dag nab, you rotten teenagers, he'd yell. I guess Lenwood's parents got sick of his act because they sent him off to military academy. You'd think that would have made Dad pretty happy, 
but I don't think he'll be satisfied until every teenager on the planet gets sent off to Juvenile Hall or Alcatraz or something. And that includes Roderick. Yesterday, Mom and Dad gave Roderick some money to buy books so he could study for the SATs. But Roderick spent the money on a tattoo instead that said, Loaded Diaper. I've still got a little time before I turn into a teenager. But the minute I do, I guarantee you Dad will be looking for the first chance to ship me out. Monday For the past week or so, Manny has been getting out of bed every night and coming downstairs. Instead of putting him right back to bed, Mom lets Manny sit with us and watch TV. It's really not fair, because when Manny is with us, I'm not allowed to watch any of the shows I like. All I can say is, when I was a kid, there wasn't any of this getting out of bed stuff. I did it once or twice, but Dad put a stop to it real quick. There was this book Dad used to read to me every night called The Giving Tree. It was a really good book, but the back of it had a picture of the author, this guy named Shel Silverstein. But Shel Silverstein looks more like a burglar or a pirate than a guy who should be writing books for kids. I mean, the guy had evil black eyebrows and a big black beard, and he was bald. Dad must have known that picture kind of freaked me out, because one night after I got out of bed, Dad said, If you get out of bed again tonight, you'll probably run into Shel Silverstein in the hallway. That really did the trick. Ever since then, I still don't get out of bed at night, even if I really need to use the bathroom. I don't think Mom and Dad read Manny any Shel Silverstein books, which probably explains why he keeps getting up after they put him to bed. I've heard some of the stories Mom and Dad read to Manny, and let me just say that the people who write these books really have a racket going. First of all, there are hardly any words in them, so I'm sure it only takes about five seconds to write one. They go something like this. Silly bear yawning. Silly bear sad. Silly bear sleeping. Silly bear glad. The end. I told Mom what I thought of Manny's books, and she said that if they were so easy to write, that I should try writing one myself. So that's exactly what I did. Trust me, it wasn't hard either. All you have to do is make up a character with a snappy name, and then make sure the character learns a lesson at the end of the book. Now all I need to do is mail this thing off to a publisher and wait for the money to start rolling in. It's called Wise Up, Mr. Shrop Sharp by Greg Hefley. Once upon a time, there was this man named Mr. Shrop Sharp who thought all these crazy thoughts, such as, I don't know much, but I do know one thing. Polar bears are some useless animals. One day, Mr. Shropshire took a ride in his car. Here I go. But then, he drove off a bridge. Oops. Later in the hospital, the doctor said, Mr. Shropshire, you would have drowned. But luckily, Tobuk the polar bear here was sitting on an iceberg, and he saved your life. And Mr. Shropshire replied, Before... I said polar bears are some useless animals, but now I can see that not every polar bear is so useless after all. The End See what I mean? The only thing I noticed after I finished the book was that I forgot to make it rhyme. But the publisher is going to have to pay me extra if they want that. Saturday well, after spending the last two weeks walking to school, I was really looking forward to kicking back and doing nothing for two days. The problem with watching TV on a Saturday is that the only thing that's on is bowling or golf. Plus, the sun comes through our sliding glass window, and you can barely see the TV screen anyway. Today, I wanted to change the channel, but the remote was on top of the coffee table. 
I was all comfortable with my bowl of cereal in my lap, so I really didn't want to get up. I tried using the force to make the remote levitate to me, even though I've tried it a million times before and it's never worked once. Today, I tried for about 15 minutes and concentrated really hard. But no luck. I just wish I'd known that Dad was standing right behind me the whole time. Dad told me I was going to have to go outside and get some exercise. I told Dad I exercise all the time, and just this morning I used the bench press he got me. But I should have come up with something more believable, because it was pretty obvious that wasn't true, since Mom uses it for a clothes drying rack. See, the reason Dad is on my case about exercise and all that is because he's got this boss named Mr. Warren, and Mr. Warren has three boys who are these crazy sports fanatics. Dad sees the Warren kids outside in their front lawn every day on his way home from work when his carpool goes by their house, doing push-ups and wind sprints and all. So I think Dad is pretty disappointed every time he gets home and sees what his sons are up to, mostly getting in trouble. Anyway, like I said, Dad kicked me out of the house today. I couldn't really think of anything I wanted to do, but then I had a good idea. Yesterday at lunch, Albert Sandy was telling everybody about this guy in China or Thailand or someplace who could jump six feet straight up in the air. No joke. The way the guy did it was by digging a hole that was three inches deep and then jumping in and out of it a hundred times. The next day, the guy doubled the size of the hole, and he jumped in and out of that. By the fifth day, he was practically like a kangaroo. Some of the guys at my table told Albert he was full of baloney, but what he was saying made a lot of sense to me. Plus, I figured if I did what Albert said and then added a few days to the program, all my problems with bullies could be over, because I could jump straight up out of reach. I got a shovel out of the garage and found a place in the front yard that looked like a good spot to dig. But before I could even get started, Mom came outside and asked me what I was up to. I told Mom I was just digging a hole, but of course she didn't like that idea. So she came up with about 20 reasons why I wasn't allowed to do it. Mom told me it was dangerous to dig in the yard because of underground electrical lines and sewage pipes and stuff. Then she made me promise up and down that I wouldn't dig any holes in our yard. So I promised. Mom went inside, but then she kept watching me out the window. I knew I was going to have to take my shovel and go dig a hole somewhere else. So I headed up to Rowley's house. I haven't been going up to Rowley's much lately. Mostly because of Fragley. Fragley has been spending a lot of time in his front yard. And sure enough, that's where he was today. He asked me, Does this scab smell funny to you? Ugh. My new strategy with Fregley is to just avoid eye contact and keep walking. And it seemed to do the trick today. When I got to Rowley's, I told him my idea, and how the two of us would practically be ninjas if we stuck with this hole jumping program I planned out. But Rowley didn't seem so hot on the idea. He said his parents might get mad if we dug a ten-foot hole in his front yard without asking them, so he was going to have to get permission first. Now, if there's one thing I know about Rowley's parents, it's that they never like my ideas. I told Rowley we could just cover the hole up with a tarp or a blanket or something and put some leaves on top of it, and his folks would never even find out. That seemed to convince him. Okay. So I admit that Rowley's parents might eventually find out, like if Rowley's dad fell down the hole with the lawnmower, but that wouldn't be for at least three or four months. Me and Rowley found a good spot in the front yard to start digging, but we ran into a problem right away. The ground was pretty much frozen solid, and we could hardly even make a dent. I spent a few minutes trying before I handed the shovel over to Rowley. He couldn't really make any progress either, but I gave him an extra long turn so he could feel like he was contributing to the project, while I sipped some hot cocoa inside. 
Rowley got a little bit further than I did, but when it started to get dark out, he gave up. I guess we'll have to take another crack at this thing tomorrow.